Ready? All right. What's up, guys? Hope you're feeling alive right now. I'm Micah Keneally, and I want to welcome you to Young Adults Today podcast, where we are talking about reaching our generation, the next generation in so our podcast good. today. Yes, baby. And I'm Josiah Keneally. It's an honor to just host this podcast with you, babe, mm -hmm. and also to come into your earbuds, your homes, mm -hmm. your workouts, your car stereo. Thanks for subscribing rating, reviewing, and sharing this episode. We just trust that it will help you as a resource. And also, if you want to share it with somebody, we trust that that'll help us reach more listeners with the message of young adults today. And new episodes drop every mm -hmm. Monday, right? Yep, every Monday early. So if you're just tuning in and you want to get connected, we over whatever over 150, 200 episodes. So you can tune in, take your pick or start from the beginning and work your way through whatever you have time to do. So and today, let's have a conversation really about ministry approach with discipleship in an era that's post-Christian and mm -hmm. post-modern. Mm -hmm. And so joining us to have this conversation is Dr. John Basie. How are you? Great to, great to see you. Great to be on the program. We're excited. And for those of you just to get getting to know Dr. John, he has his PhD from Baylor University, where they have a culture of joy mm -hmm. in their basketball program, <laughs> some national champions there. Uh, but he serves as the director of master's experience mm -hmm. at Impact 360 Institute in Pine Mountain, Georgia. He's also the author of a brand new book. This resource is titled No be and live, which is really a 360 approach mm -hmm. to discipleship in a post-Christian era. So we'll be just really just leaning into a conversation centered around the faith of the next generation. And before we do, John, could you just um, start by with us, with the listener, sharing with us some of your story and your leadership journey? Sure. Glad to. Really appreciate having the opportunity to, to do this with, with you and your listeners. You bet. I was raised in a, uh, a Christ-following home. Uh, I was uh, the son of a, of a pastor, and uh, my, my mother and father raised me uh, to believe from an early age uh, in Christ, and I, I can remember uh, following him really ever since I was five years old. At that age, you know, you, you know the basics. Um, and so it was really in my teen years that uh, I, I found uh, really amazing fellowship through the, the youth discipleship program of our church. And the Lord really showed up there uh, for me. And um, I was able to own that faith mm -hmm. for myself. Wow. And, um, and that was a key thing on my, on my journey and uh, really caught a vision for discipling young people in college as I became a residence assistant in college. And um, through my professional career uh, in Christian higher education, uh, just seeing the need and seeing how uh, Jesus, really, Jesus really needs he needs us to be fully on where we are. He, he, he yeah. doesn't need us to do his work, but he chooses to use us. And if, if we say yes, Lord, then we need to be fully on where we are. And that's what I'm about is to helping, helping young people to uh, just really grow and learn and mm -hmm. be fully on for the kingdom where they are. It's amazing. That's so good. That's definitely where Josiah and I reside in our prayer life is 100%. wanting the next generation and the current generations to understand yeah. that each of us has a part, but discipleship is a huge um, factor when it comes into play. It's really, um, who am I discipling? Who am I discipled by? And what does that look like? How do we bridge that gap between generations, but also how do we lead where we are planted and be present in those moments while being lifelong learners? And I would just be curious to see what are the main obstacles for young adults who are a part of Gen Z as it relates to discipleship, like in particularly? Yeah, really great question. And as, as you would know, every generation has uh, its share of unique obstacles. Totally. Uh, one thing that we really try to stress for Gen Z, which would also be true for other, for other generations, uh, but particularly true for Gen Z, 
is that discipleship is meant for them, but it's also meant to go be beyond them. Yeah. Right. Um, we don't just reap the rewards of being disciples and then say, well, this is great. Now I'm a lot more like Jesus and I feel better about myself. Uh, I do think this can be a huge challenge with Gen Z more than in the past. Uh, since feelings in our current culture are, are upheld as one of the most important values. Now, feelings yeah. are important. Perhaps those were undervalued in some of the past generations, but now um, with feelings being the value, be, being really one of the top values, the risk is that uh, our young disciples might be tempted to hoard it and just keep it to themselves. Mm. Uh, so instead, we gently remind them no wait we're, we're called to be multipliers yeah, yeah. Uh, as indicated by matthew 28 and uh to go and create more disciples uh so that that sense i think to answer your question is uh of of well to keep it to myself maybe that's more of a challenge now than in the past another one is that we're living in an age of digital saturation yeah mm -hmm. uh most of them have had unrestricted access to a mobile device for as long as they can remember. Yep. Uh, it's a challenge, as you would know, to get their attention when their eyes are constantly stuck to some kind of screen. Yep. Um, and so one question we would ask is, how are screens discipling these young people? Uh, Long ago, Augustine talked about how how our loves, our, our various loves, can be shaped. How do we come to love the right things? Yeah. And and uh, in his own conversion story, you know, he's he's uh, uh, talking as as a as an ancient church father, um, <laughs> but uh, he, he's he's uh, he's thinking ahead as well, and 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 asking. I think us here in, in 2021, how is it that our desires are being shaped? What are the what are the disciplers of these young people? And it turns out so often uh, they are screens. It's TikTok. It's yeah. it's Facebook, and um, whatever happens to be uh, coming across those screens. And then finally, the entire area of morality is just a huge challenge. Uh, some of the, the obvious topics like sexuality, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's uh, of course, one that, that we could discuss and one that's of concern to many parents. But what about something that isn't talked about as much? Something not quite as, say, interesting when we talk about morality. Like what? Well, like lying. So for example, According to one Gen Z study, only 34% of Gen Z believes that lying is morally wrong. And what does that mean for the rest of their lives? Yeah. So I, I do think there are some unique challenges with this generation. No kidding. And, <clears throat> you know, my kid and I have the opportunity to have served in local churches mm -hmm. as a young adult pastor, also as campus missionaries um, on a college campus. And then well, one of the things that I'm seeing and coming across is that the next generation has real questions. And I mm -hmm. think there's merit and validity to their questions. My fear is that if we don't take their questions seriously, mm -hmm. we're going to end up in a, in a place similar to where we are, honestly, right now in 2021, Dr. John, and that's that, you know, young generations feel that they're asking questions that the church isn't providing answers to. And then the church mm -hmm. is providing answers to questions that they're not asking. And yes. so one of the things that is happening then is just this this um, movement of deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what have you found or what are your experiences as far as when it comes to maybe young millennials or, or um, also even older generation Z when it comes to discipleship and when those that we're ministering to are asking really hard questions or questioning their faith and thinking about a process of deconstruction? Yeah, great question. Uh, 
you, I think you're really hitting on something that, that we at the Institute see here every year. We, we started our student programs back in 2006. And what you're talking about has increased tenfold, maybe more than that. And, and that is, uh, it's, it's the question that David Kinneman in, in one of the studies of Gen Z that we part, the Institute partnered with, with the Barna Group and David Kinneman to produce original research on which, on which uh, this, this book is based. Uh, Kinneman asks, is it possible that the church is preparing uh, these young people for for a culture that no longer exists. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to your point, we have students every year when we start talking with them about their deeper questions right. who inevitably will tell us, I did not feel invited or safe to ask these questions in my home church. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, now the goal of course, isn't finger pointing here. Uh, it's not it's not to cast blame, but I do think it's important to be real about it. And this isn't just a one off thing. It's it's consistent. Yeah, um, it's the exception rather than the rule that a student will say, well, actually, I had a great experience where I had a youth minister, youth minister or mentor or discipler uh, who was provided by the church for the specific purpose of helping me with these questions. We almost never hear that. As far as deconstruction, moral relativism is rampant. Uh, what is right turns out to be a function of my in-group. And an even more uh, pernicious view of that is, well, uh, maybe, maybe it's not even so much a function of my in-group. Maybe it's just solely up to me as far as what is right and wrong. And, and so we are, we are seeing that as well. We're seeing where students want to say, well, yeah, I love Jesus and I wanna be a part of the church, but I can't really say that there's anything morally wrong with someone else who uh, is coming from a completely different worldview. Um, is Jesus the only way? Well. Maybe if I think so, that's that's fine. But if someone else doesn't think so, well, who am I to say? Uh, and I, and so I do think that kind of deconstruction is, is happening all around us. Uh, as you would see, the media surely is 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 not help. At least the mainstream media is not helping in this regard. And discipleship, biblical discipleship, is just needed more than ever before. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's definitely one of the biggest needs that we see working with young adults is that they're not being held accountable to anybody. There's no accountability partners. They have all these questions, but they turn to the internet for the answers. Google, YouTube, TikTok. Or, yeah. Anybody absolutely. that they can follow. And it kind of like, I'll choose to follow people who, whose belief system aligns with mine. So the sin that I'm living in doesn't feel like sin. It just becomes everyday living. Yes. And uh, I would, I would also, you had basically touched on, are we preparing young adults for, truly for the world in which they live? Like, are we equipping them for a world that no longer exists? And we were able to listen to Dr. Is it not, I don't know if he's a doctor, but pastor Erwin McManus, he's also yeah. an author of a couple of books and we were able to listen to him. And he said, the degree that I have and what I was prepared to, and how I was prepared to reach individuals through my education no longer exists. Like that approach doesn't exist anymore. And how do, how does he as a leader and how do we as leaders not conform to the culture, but be responsible for our relationship with Christ and responsible for the yeah. things he's asked us to steward and how to lead in a Christ centered way and point people to Christ, not to the sin that they're in essentially, or not to us as their leaders or pastors, but how do we come alongside and truly disciple and mentor and earn the right to speak into their life, earn a right to, to say, Hey, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. Come alongside me, or I'm going to come alongside you come into my house. Let's go get groceries together. Let's go to the gym together. Let's pray about your future together. And when we see that, and when we're actually doing that, I mean, people are asking us now, literally last week, 
Will you do my wedding? Will you do my marriage mentoring? Cause we're marriage uh, mentor coaches. Would wow. you help me start a strong foundation with a person I want to spend the rest of my life with um, to the next level? I mean, we've been doing it maybe alone or only with a couple of people, but they've invited us in on that process. And those are yep. some of the fun rewards to see that people are taking ownership um, of their relationship with Christ. They're owning up in whatever sin they may be walking in and they're ready to, to really hone in on, you know, what God's wanting to do in and through them. And I would just say, because of the tools that we have access to, we have the internet, we have people, we have whatever icon people want to follow or, you know, people they want to model their lives after. Um, what are some of the most important tools that we can use as leaders to reach and disciple Gen Z and meet them where they're at instead of us having this old school textbook 2000, this is how you should run a young adult youth group. Like how do we, right. how do we do that and not conform to the world, but yeah. to be leaders in the world for Jesus in that process? <laughs> yeah, great, great question. You know, this is a question we're asking ourselves here at Impact 360 Institute as well. And how do we hold on to truth, uh, but remain appropriately relevant? And so yeah. one, one tool that we have in our tool, tool belt is that of uh, contextualization. Good. And, and so we're asking ourselves, how do we stick firmly to the truth with a capital T? with the Bible at the center, but appropriately contextualize for Gen Z in order to meet them where they are. Uh, what are some examples of this? Well, perhaps one could be worship music. Uh, I, I, as a Gen Xer, don't necessarily gravitate towards the same style of wor worship music as many of the Gen Zers. Really? No, I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. It doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, but but this is an area where I do think it is appropriate to ask the question: Okay, what is the what is the function of worship, and what is what is the form that it's taking, and can I contextualize appropriately, and in so doing, set some of my own preferences aside. They're truly preferences in this case uh, for the sake of connecting with these young people. What I don't want to set aside is the truth with a capital T. Okay, so that's one tool is, is contextualization, uh, contextualization. Another one, uh, and this won't surprise you or your audience, I don't think, but uh, we want to be sure that we are basing our tools on the outcomes that we're aiming for. And so the main outcome that we're looking for is for these Gen Z members to become apprentices of Jesus. Yeah. Right. Uh, someone who would become like him. Now, what does a holistic model of discipleship look like? That's what this book, No Be Live, is really about, it's based on the three biblical mandates, the cultural mandate, fill and subdue the earth in Genesis one, the great commandment ma mandate, love of God and love of neighbor that we find in both the Old Testament and reiterated in the New Testament. And then finally, the great commission mandate in Matthew 28 to make disciples all over the world. And there are specific forms of discipleship that we can identify within each of those uh, great mandates. So for example, the creation mandate, fill and subdue the earth isn't just about populating it with children, although it includes that, but it, it, it literally means God said to Adam and Eve, you finish the garden. I'm choosing not to, but you're going to partner with me and you're actually going to finish it through building homes, through building businesses, through building cities. So now what do we have? We actually have what we call vocational discipleship. What does it mean to look like Jesus in various vocations, in the work itself? Okay. And of course, yes, proclaiming the gospel where we have opportunity to do so, but recognizing that as we wait for those opportunities, 
the work itself, the work of being an architect, for example, is good in and of itself because God said at the very beginning, go and build, go and subdue mm -hmm. the earth. So that's another tool. And then finally, I want to emphasize the importance of uh, study. Study is a key tool. Uh, specifically studying how God's revelation, uh, his two forms of revelation, general revelation, looking, looking at the world, uh, as the sage does in Proverbs, what do natural tendencies in the world look like? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it look like to, to uh, build and cultivate? And, and we do that. This is one of the reasons we go to college, in fact, and, and learn the various disciplines, right? If you're a math major, if you're an English major, if you're a, uh, a, some kind of science major, a biology, perhaps, mm -hmm. pre-med, pre you're learning about God's creation through his, his general, general revelation, his created order, and you're studying those things, but you're also learning his word, his special revelation. And we have to know his word inside and out so that we can know how his word and his world are inextricably tied together. They are, they are yeah. already a okay. unity. They are already unified, but because of sin, because of a fallen world, it's unclear to us how these things come together sometimes. So study is extremely important. For mm -hmm. example, the study of the question, what is a human person becomes very, very important. So those are a few tools. Those tools are so good and so practical. And, and one of the things that I love that you just talked about is vocation. Mm -hmm. I think it was also a Barna group that said 75% of young adults are asking the question, what's my purpose in life? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that true. would mean that one out of four either aren't looking for their purpose in life, which is possible, or maybe they believe they've already landed their purpose, that they've already discovered that. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority is still asking the question, like, how does my faith impact the rest of my life? Like the 24 seven question, not just Sundays, but the right. other six days of the week. And I think that, um, for example, Timothy Keller has done an amazing job with that calling his book, Every Good Endeavor. And we've heard from people on this podcast who are a major league baseball player, mm -hmm. read that book, and instead of retiring and just golfing, decided to help get behind the water well initiative mm -hmm. and, and bring, you know, change and, and purpose here on earth. And so I think that that's key. And then one of the other things that, I mean, like last week over a cup of coffee, somebody asked me is how as a 23 year old, do I truly follow Christ in 2021? And I'm like, that is such a good question. Just keep asking that question every day. And, and I just really want to say thank you for listening to this podcast right now, because your role as a leader mm -hmm. and as a disciple who, a, a follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. a disciple who makes other disciples, you're valuable in this process. And uh, I think of what Paul said in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Right. And so this, Dr. John, this is the leadership question and the discipleship question, because I want to ask you in your research and in your field experience, how have you seen leadership and discipleship intersect to work together? Yeah. This is, uh, this is a really, really profound and important question. Our, our, to start, uh, our, our mission at Impact 360 Institute is to cultivate leaders who follow Jesus. We do that through a number of programs, uh, and I won't go into those right now. Uh, but in, inherent in the very thing that we are about here is a blending of those two, discipleship and leadership. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. And and you would know, you would have listeners who understand this right away that that Jesus was really doing both, wasn't he? And right. And as were others who followed him. 
uh, like the Apostle Paul, although he he had to have a little bit more convincing, a little bit more arm twisting. Some of us are that way, aren't we? <laughs> That's right. Uh, so so one of the things that we find to be to be really important in this question of how do they intersect discipleship and leadership is is really talking about leadership from a servant leadership perspective, asking the question, how intentionally am I looking for the image of God in those I am seeking to influence? How intentionally am I looking for the image of God in those I am seeking to influence? If we ask this question, when we, when we come to the leadership table, it will be almost impossible not to also simultaneously engage in discipleship. Why? Because we're seeing the other person primarily as an image bearer, not as merely someone who will just carry out tasks that I say go and do, right? That's, that's the old command and control model of leadership, which, which is pretty much dead here in 2021. It worked in a uh, in a former era, but it doesn't work anymore. Um, and so this idea of, of servant leadership, and there are great movements and organizations such as Lead Like Jesus, who have made um, a lot of headway in this area. It's just the servant leadership is key to understanding how I as a leader and uh, discipleship are really two sides of the same coin. That's so good. I saw a question kind of following up. Many of the people probably listening to this podcast or maybe in their first role as leaders, um, as pastors, as maybe key volunteers that are wanting to see a young adult ministry happen and kind of develop. And one thing that we kind of see a lack of at times, not 100%, but at times are the people who are so-called called into ministry. They're not being discipled themselves. They say they're discipling others and they may be discipling others, but they're constantly giving and there's maybe no accountability in their life. Maybe there's um, nobody speaking into the process of their personal growth and spiritual development. And do you have some? No, that's oh. important. Oh. It's important. So this is saying. just something that's kind of been stirring in my heart and mind is to pray, obviously, for this next generation, but also be an individual who is, if I'm going to say I'm discipling people, I also want to be discipled. And in that process, I would just say, how would you encourage or what would you say to a young adult pastor, key volunteer, maybe a student landing that first job or coming out of their college years? What would you say to them about being discipled? Like how how do you ask me to disciple you and what do you look for in a person that you're seeking discipleship from? Yeah. Great question. This is, this is something that I, I, I just, I could not agree with you more. We can't give away what we don't have ourselves. Spot on. And so we, we have to have others who are ahead of us speaking into our lives as disciples, those who have, have gone before, who are farther along in their journey with, with Jesus th than we are. And I, while, I, while I don't think there's necessarily any formula uh, that will work every single time for every person, here, here are some things that I've kept in mind and, and I think as we have used them here at the Institute have worked pretty well uh, as, as we've encouraged others in their discipleship journeys. And that is simply uh, a, what we would call a four, uh, a four C model, character, competence, chemistry, and calling. So the, the person that, that you go after has to have the kind of Jesus-like character that, that's, a, that's a prerequisite. Um, they have to have the competence. There may be a mentor that, that has the character, but they, they don't, their area of expertise isn't really what you need at this time. Perhaps you want to be farther along in terms of, of preaching, let's say, uh, or expositing the word. 
you want to have someone who has done much study in this area and has more competence than you do. So in that case, you need the character and the competence. And then the third one, chemistry, you need to be able to get along well with the person. And it needs to be an easy fit. It, it, when, when you wake up in the morning and, and it's time to meet with this person, you don't want to think, oh, no, you know, I, I just I want I know I have to do this, but it wears me out to meet with this mentor that that's just not right. going to work. That's right. not going to be a win. And then finally calling, uh, is, is, is this mentor who is being asked called to do this for you at this time, they may have the character, the competence and the chemistry, but there may be good reasons that, that God has laid on their heart, why they might not be called at this time. So they, the one that says yes, we would assume has prayed about it and, and sought the Lord, you know, should I take this person on? And they would be called to do so. The final thing I would say is it's really important for those of you who, who might find yourselves in a situation where you're pouring out for others, but you're not being poured into, own your own development. That's own really good. Your own development. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't mean you can just teach yourself. Don't, don't just start Googling everything you think you need to know, but rather if you find that nobody is approaching you proactively, what would it take for you to go out and find somebody? Of course, with the Lord's help through prayer, Lord, help me to find the right person. But what would it take for me to steward myself? After all, we are to self-steward right? Uh, we have to put on the oxygen mask before we can help somebody else. And there's, there's, there's something very biblical about that. Uh, Jesus would, would literally leave the crowds. Yep. Uh, there days where he would be healing, and I'm sure they would be lined up. And there would eventually be someone where Jesus said, I'm sorry, the last person was it. Can you imagine being that, that person who wasn't healed? But he knew that for, for what he was put here for, he needed to put on his own oxygen mask and be restored. So those are a couple of things that I, a few things I would share. I've heard it so often said, you know, about the oxygen mask and that we can't, you know, pour out our cup that's not filled up first. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is so important is what you said to follow it up of like the abiding rhythm with Jesus, getting in the quiet place, yep. the personal spiritual disciplines, a lifestyle of holiness. Like there's always going to be another person to save, but if you're not healthy, you're not going to be able to be a vessel. Not <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be able to be a vessel. And one of the things that I uh, read in a Carrie Newhoff blog about the next generation is he said to boards, to leaders, to pastors, to churches, maybe the denominations that are wrestling with this question mm -hmm. about discipling the next generation. He said, as you have conversations, you know, for example, like this one, mm -hmm. he said, as you have conversations about the next generation, just be sure to include them at the table. Wow. Be, be sure to involve the next generation in conversations because so often, you know, to Clay Scroggins point about, you know, how to lead when, yeah, when you're not in charge. So often conversations about us are had without us in the room. And so mm -hmm. at least if we're going to be serious about reaching the next generation, I just think of who might God be illuminating mm -hmm. in your path, in your life, in your network or your church, in your community that, that could be an advocate around the next generation, a spokesperson, if you will, an ambassador mm -hmm. for Christ and for their generation. Because I think that so often it's easy to have a conversation about people without them in the room. And so mm -hmm. I would like to ask you though, Dr. John, to follow that up. Why do you believe in the next generation? And why do you think that efforts like um, young adult ministry or young adult discipleship are so important? Yes. One reason is as we look in scripture, you see a, a history of, of very young people being used by God. Uh, you see, 
you see the disciples themselves who who were were, were quite young. Um, some of them, some of them probably uh, the very age that that your ministry is 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 targeted towards. You know, the the young twenties, and perhaps even younger than that. Um, and and so and and we see you know we see in the New Testament where where Paul exhorts um, Timothy not to be not to be shy because he is young, not to be lacking in courage because he's young. Uh, these people have callings right now. They, they may not be fully developed. Uh, we're all a work in progress, but they are called to do something as they discern the fullness of their calling. They're called to do something right now and and so therefore their their first calling is to Christ himself and and to be more like him and and so young people young adults as apprentices of Jesus are in a unique space to be able to soak up and understand things about his word and his world that would be kind of difficult for younger disciples to understand. And, and they're also more flexible uh, than many, many of us who are older, like, like Gen Xers, like me, <laughs> who have become kind of set in my, set in my, I'll just speak for myself, set in my ways. Um, they have most of their lives ahead of them. And they can, they can offer their energy they can offer uh, their ideas. You know, so many of the, uh, the positive move movements in uh, church history, especially in, in the United States, have come about because of, of uh, movements uh, in, uh, on college campuses. Um, you know, we can look at, at uh, some of the... The, the, the revivals that, that have happened in, in uh, you know, the last 150 years and point to, point to uh, some key ones where, where young people on campuses um, decided, you know, the Lord is, is, is at work and we need to do something about this. Um, and transformation uh, really took place in, in a lot of those cases. So uh, a lot of energy, and um, we just, we really believe in them. Yeah, I think that's dead on. Like, God is still on the move, no matter what we choose to see. I mean, some will say that, you know, what is, is this generation, you know, are they even going to live for the Lord? And are they living for the Lord? And as we treat, uh, speak, and as we travel, we see thousands of young adults each year gather. I mean, if we're going to go down to passion, I'm like 65,000 young adults ringing in the new year, worshiping yes. the name of Praise Jesus. God. Like, yeah hello, like God is still moving and young adults are still responding. It's just a matter of, are we as leaders, are we going to pass the baton that's been handed to us? And I would ask any generation that have you passed the baton and are you passing the baton? Because that's what legacy that we want to leave behind, that we did everything we could do for the next generation and to help bridge the gaps between generations too. I mean, it's not just about the younger, it's about us being linking arms up and down yeah. and just being an, a link in God's story and just hopefully pointing people to Christ in that process. And um, discipleship is very important. So if you're listening and you do not have somebody speaking into your life and you are not being discipled, and that is one of your passions and desires. And if it's not pray that it becomes a passion and, yeah. and a desire for you, because we all need somebody to process life with. We all need somebody to be praying for us, to be holding us accountable, to be calling us to, to new heights and new depths of intimacy with God. And um, God will illuminate those people as totally. time goes on. And sometimes 
you just give people a portion of what area you want to grow in. Like Dr. John, you had said, like, if you want to grow in your speaking ability and your teaching, preaching and your expository, you know, approach, well, then find people that you admire, reach out to them, ask them, because most of the time people aren't going to look even like, I'm going to mentor you and I'm going to disciple you. No, you have to become bold and brave yeah. and ask people to pour into your life and speak into your life. And don't be offended if they do call you out. <laughs> Because that's right. part of the process, right? We have to have a humble heart. We need to be teachable. We need to be spirit led and we need to be available for, you know, being discipled, but also um, available to God and what he wants to do in that process. It's so true, baby. And I watched you, you were 27 at the time. And I'm going to ask you a question <laughs> because I remember you had moved from North Dakota to Minnesota and you yeah. had an amazing home church. Mm -hmm. You went back to college for another degree. You had an amazing network in North Dakota. And then you moved to a new state yeah. where the apple cart was disrupted of, of not your faith, but the disciple, the, the, the mentors. Yeah. And so how did you approach like finding new mentors in a new city or new season of life? Mm -hmm. Well, I think knowing that there's a sunrise and a sunset on every discipleship or relationship that stems from that, it can happen. I mean, you can have people discipling you or that discipleship turns into a friendship and maybe they're in their seventies and eighties, you know, and they're just become like a grandparent or a parent to you um, in whatever age you are in. I would say what I personally prayed for is Lord, I want to grow in my ability to discern um, aspects of the Holy spirit and discern the voice of God. So uh, from afar, like I, watched a couple of women who are truly thriving in that area that that's part of their spiritual gift set is similar to mine when it comes to the gifts of the prophetic and all those different things and I'm like I want to I want to function in this but I want to do it biblically and I want to do it well so I would approach them um, admiring them from afar saying hey can I just grab coffee with you and just so pick good. your brain on something and I didn't ask them to necessarily mentor me the first time I met with them, but I was saying, Hey, can I hear parts of your story? Can I pick your brain? And then the second time is like, you know, I'd love to do this again. Is there any way that you could speak into this portion of my life? I'm giving you permission to call me out. If you see something in my spiritual walk, or if you want to challenge me, or if there's anything you could help direct me in, please do so. So I found somebody with that. I also found another lady who actually moved to the same time I did from North Dakota yeah. to Minnesota. And she was actually the pastor's wife of the old church, but she was not necessarily mentoring me there one-on-one. -on -one. But when I moved here, I said, Hey, I see that you are a phenomenal parent and you understand the dynamics of raising um, children who are following Christ. You have four that are serving the Lord. They're all in their early twenties. And now they're kind of in their later twenties and early thirties. But I said, I would love for you to start speaking in this portion of my life. I'm not married yet, but I do desire to have children. Um, um, how do I become first and foremost, a woman of God? Uh, what does it look like to be a pastor's wife? And how do you process that when you're called to ministry yourself as a woman in, in ministry and then the parenting aspect. So she was kind of like the three in one where I really wanted to grow and be like, okay, call me out, call me up. And would you be opening, would you be willing to open up your story and your life to me so I can learn from you? And um, so praying those people in Powerful. and granted, you don't approach anybody and say, speak into every area of my life, blah. It's like, no, no, I see this person and they're really thriving here. And I admire that about them. And to me, I'm like, they have to be God fearing. They have to be person of prayer. They have to be on fire for what God is doing and they have to be in tune with the spirit and they have to be bold enough to call me out for my personality. Yeah. So not everybody may look at those things it's, or be that, be that a, a aggressive or whatever, well, but kind of the chemistry piece. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Kind of, you know. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's so, fun. Thanks for going there. I didn't know you were going to go there. It, Here we go. <laughs> I think that's super helpful that if you are seeking out mentors in your life, what Mike is so is pray. Yeah. God will illuminate them and then be willing to have the courage to ask. Yeah. Don't say no for somebody. Yeah. And um, Dr. John, we've reached a point in our conversation with you that we really love to lean in and just get to know you better and, yeah. and have fun, but also pick your brain a little bit further. We call it the final thoughts, five and five. It's a little bit more rapid fire. And uh, to kick us off, question one is if you could describe yourself in three words, what would they be? I would say purposeful, improvement seeking, and contemplative. Ooh, fancy. All right. That's good. Okay. Question <laughs> number two, for the leader just starting out in ministry, 
or just starting out, maybe in the marketplace, even how do you start strong and finish well? Yeah, great question. I would say in terms of how to start, first learn how to follow well, Good. seek to understand that servant leadership model that we were talking about a while ago, uh, where you prize people and relationships above all else. That doesn't mean we, we don't try to get results, but first and foremost, we are leading and serving image bearers, image bearers. Good. Uh, and keeping in mind the great commandment, love of God and love of neighbor, which, which would be at the core. And another thing I would say as far as starting and finishing well, um, if, if we can do that with God's help, learning how to follow well, keeping the great commandment in mind the whole way, finishing well looks like staying the course through adversity. Mm. There will be hard moments, uh, but we need to proceed wisely through adversity, according to Psalm 90, 12, which says, teach us to number our days so that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Yep. I love that insight. That's one of my favorite questions to ask leaders who are further along the journey than mm -hmm. us, that we get to glean some wisdom from you. And we definitely want to be people of consistency. And as Eugene Peterson said, long obedience in the same direction. And third question is um, a fun one. This book, Know, Be, and Live. I think um, I counted 16 contributors in the 13 chapters. And one of the things that it told me without saying it is that the approach to reaching the next generation and to, to disciple people in a post-Christian culture, we've got to team up. And yes. all of us is smarter than one of us. And God can use all of us on the same team as the winning team more than just any single one voice. And can you, would you be willing to just speak to that concept of working together or, you know, what that was like for you even? Yeah, it was such an honor to work with all these people. One of the, one of the ways that we chose the contributors to this No Be Live book, we thought it was important to choose contributors who not just were somewhat familiar with the population, Gen Z, but worked with them on a, re a regular basis. And so every single contributor works in a meaningful way regularly with Gen Z, whether they're a Christian college professor, whether they're in ministry of some sort, uh, you name it, it's, they, they work with Gen Z, um, on, on an almost daily basis. And, and I think the way you put it was, is, is, right, is right on. There's, there's a council, there's a council of wisdom. It's not just one person who is going to get us there in discipleship. Uh, Micah, I, lo I love what, what you said a while ago, the, the, the sunrise and sunset with regard to uh, discipling relationships mm -hmm. that that may be what some discipleship relationships look like some may not be for a lifetime uh, but this this book takes takes the counsel approach for sure and and we very much assume that uh, those who who uh, wrote on their chapters are true experts in their areas in ways that that I would not be that's so good. Well, we look forward to everybody else getting their copy right. and we'll put everything in the show notes when it comes to how they can get this book into their hands, hopefully by Christmas, right? Is that yeah. the date? Maybe it could be some fun stocking stuff for so some good. people, but here's the curveball, Dr. John question. Number four, if you could ask Josiah and myself something, what would you ask us today? Yes. This is a great, great question because you have such a a far reach and, and influence, what would you say that churches need to be doing right now to better equip young disciples of Jesus uh, for, for this particular cultural moment? 
Oof, that's good. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, we recently had a weekend here in Minnesota. It was the first ever, it was called the YA weekend. And um, there was on six weeks notice because at that season, our state had kind of just opened up the Mm -hmm. mask mandate ended and stuff like that. And there was people from 40 different churches, I think on six weeks notice around 230 or 250 young adults that came and, um, I was fired up and every single person I talked to there, you know what they said, Dr. John, they said, Mm -hmm. I've been looking forward to this since the day I signed up. Right. And what it dawned on me, it was kind of one of those aha moments for me to be like, wow, I'm glad we made this event and we stepped out in faith and we, we did it. We booked the campground and we, we went for it. Mm-hmm. It was hard work. It was so worth it. You know why it gave young adults something to look forward to on their calendar for Christ, because so yeah. many people are coming out of a season of life where there's nothing on their calendar, yeah. not to mention, there's nothing on the calendar to look forward to, not to mention a mm-hmm. one step more, which as spiritual leaders were people of imitation that we can actually create opportunities. Yeah that people can look forward to within the local church, within their campus ministry. And I'm just like, if we're not giving young disciples something to look forward to following Jesus, I don't know how well we're serving them. Because do you realize what an incredible opportunity it is to give people something to look forward to? Let's go. Let's do that. What about you, babe? Well, yeah, I think the biggest thing that, well, Josiah and I feel the conviction of providing opportunities for young adults, and that is to use their spiritual gifts, to get involved, to bring your foot. You want to, you want to take photos? You're going to run photography at this event. If you are good at prepping food and you want to cook and bake and provide the hospitality aspect of it, you're on the team. Like, so being able to equip young adults, instead of only setting the table for them and saying, come to us. We want to equip people and let them know, like, teach them how to set the table for others, teach Mm -hmm. them how to invite people to that table, teach people that there's always room and there's always one more chair that can be pulled up no matter what. And Mm -hmm. one thing that I've realized that they want from the church is they want truth. They don't want fluffed up. They don't want the watered down version. They want truth, but they want it done in a relational way. They don't want to be like, well, I'm in an ungodly relationship and the church says that I should do X, Y, and Z, but it's like, no, they want to know the, why should I stay out of bed before marriage? Why should I learn how to manage my finances in singleness? Why should I deal with my pornography addiction? Why should I have somebody discipling me? They really do want to lean in. But when we approach them in a legalistic way and we get in their face and we haven't earned that right to speak into their life, they'll lean out faster and they will, they won't even come to the door. But what we've come across is they want to be asked the hard, challenging questions without an agenda, like to know that we can point them to truth, but not say, I'm going to mentor you and I'm here to fix you. No, that's not what they want. They want a relationship with you and they want to observe your life and be like, is Micah the same person she is on stage, on air, in the grocery store, in her home, down the street? Like if I can remain consistent as an individual that I am the same person, and if the church would ever be, Big C Church were to be unified as the true body that God had intended for and to do that and to do that well, I mean, that's what they're looking for. They want, they want truth, um, but I would say for the people listening who, what can the church do? Start a young adult ministry. Yeah. If you feed them, they will come. If you build it, they will come. If you provide Mm. opportunities, they will come. And it might be small. It might be a life group. It might be organic of 10, 20 people. Hey, we've seen that model happen with 12 around the table. Within 24 months, it grew to over 200. And so I would say, like, just the church just seems to be on our knees on all levels, not just for what we want from God, but what God wants for us. So sorry, that was a long answer. I took five minutes right there. How how do we do? (laughs) That's, that's fantastic. A plus. (laughs) That's cool. Well, one more to wrap things up five of five, Dr. John, it's been so fun, such a treat getting to know you hear your heart. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your research. We just acknowledge you for that. And Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you this question as we close is, if you could picture yourself in a room that's filled with college pastors and young leaders, mm-hmm. 
people really passionate about reaching millennials and Generation Z and the generations after that even. And you can tell this group one thing and we handed you the microphone. What would you like to tell them? I would, I would go back to something we were discussing earlier and just emphasize the holistic nature of discipleship, that a biblical model takes into account the no, which is that, that study portion that we were talking about, intellectual discipleship, we might call it. It takes the B into account, character formation uh, and character discipleship. Uh, based on the great commandment, love of God and love of neighbor. And then finally, the live in our know, be, and live book, uh, the great commission, sharing the good news and living, living it out with our neighbors and also finding out what that might look like uh, in our various vocations. Uh, so I would emphasize that holistic model with them. That's great. I love it. And Dr. John, we just want to say thanks one more time for investing into Micah and I mm -hmm. and into the leaders and listeners of Young Adults today. Thank you. It was an honor. And uh, if you're listening and tuning in, maybe watching on YouTube, uh, we just want to say that you can find out more about John Basie. Mm -hmm. This book, No Be Live, that we've mm -hmm. been having a great conversation about an approach to discipleship in a post-Christian era, as well as you can find out more about the 360 Institute when you mm -hmm. connect with us on our website at youngadults.today. Um, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share this episode, as well as you can check out more ways that you can contribute mm -hmm. and invest and be involved at Patreon dot com slash young adults today. But thanks so much. Yeah. And until next time, this is Josiah and Micah Keneally.